my name is Mikko Hyppönen from F-Secure Corporation. And this here is the website of the Atom Energy Organization of Iran. And a couple of months ago, I received an email, completely by surprise, out of the blue, by a researcher, an analyst, a nuclear scientist who was working there. And he emailed me because he wanted to inform me that they, once again their nuclear program has been breached. And he wanted to, the world to know about this. And in particular, he emailed me that there's some music playing randomly on several of the workstations inside the Atom Energy Organization of Iran. They were playing at full volume in the middle of the night and the nuclear scientist believed the song was from the American band ACDC and the song was Thunderstruck. Now, I don't actually know if this really happened. I don't actually know if they were really playing Thunderstruck at full volume in the middle of the night at the Atom Energy Organization of Iran, but it's possible. What I do know is that these emails were indeed coming really from the Atom Energy Organization of Iran. I don't know why this guy emailed me. When I search with the guy's name, there is a really a guy with this name. He is a real nuclear scientist. He's published several nuclear sci scientific papers about different effects of radiation and, and stuff like that. And he was exchanging email back and forth with me from the Atom Energy Organization. Now, assuming this really happened, let's, let's assume for a second he's telling the truth, that this really was happening. Why would any attacker do this? Why would they start playing music at the middle of the night? It doesn't really make any sense, because they basically let the uh, victim know that they've been pwned, they've been attacked, they've been had. Why would anybody do that? Then again, if you go and read the book Confront and Conceal by David Sanger from the New York Times, one key note about the United States and the Israel operations against Iran, the Operation Olympic Games, one of the key points of these operations, as documented in the book, was to make the enemy feel stupid. Make sure that the enemy feels they are stupid. For example, the problems that they were causing with the centrifuges at the Bushra nuclear enrichment plant in Iran, for several months, um, the scientists thought that they were just doing, a, they, they, they weren't doing their work right. They were screwing something up. Lots of people were fired because of the problems they had with the centrifuge. They had no idea that they really weren't stupid. They were being attacked. So for something like this to happen in the real world, for somebody to start playing Thunderstruck, what would be the motive? Well, one motive could be that the attacker has already been in, they've already stolen the information they were looking for, and they now wanted to make sure that all the employees in the organization know that their IT department can't defend them. And the best way to make this happen is to play music in the middle of the night from all the computers. Now everybody knows that we're infected. Everybody knows that something's happening here. And they know that their own IT security department can't handle it. So once again, I don't know if it really happened, but maybe it did. And this is just one example of the kind of attacks we're seeing. This is obviously a very unusual attack. In fact, this isn't the attack we really should be worrying about because it's highly unlikely any of us personally or any of our organization becomes a victim for such an attack. Yet, attacks like these exist. And I strongly believe that if we want to have any hope at all in defending our systems against attacks, we have to understand who we're fighting. We have to understand who's behind the attacks and what's the motive of the attacker. If we don't understand the motive of the attacker, we have no hope in defending ourselves. Because the attacks and the techniques used in the attacks are completely different. You take a look at an organization which is being attacked by a criminal attacker, trying to steal money. His techniques and motives are completely different than, let's say, another organization which is being targeted by the Anonymous. Completely different attacks, completely different motives. So we have to understand who we're fighting. 
And once you understand who we're fighting, then you have to, un to, to have some kind of a measure how likely your organization is to become a victim of certain kind of attack. For example, a local pizza place doesn't have to worry about governmental level attacks. Nobody's interested. Nobody's going to spy them. However, if you work for a local defense contractor, suddenly you do have to worry about espionage, governmental level attacks, and information leakage. So you, you start preparing the defense by understanding your risk level and understanding who's after you, who could be after you, and if they're after you, how would they be doing it? So F-Secure has been around for 25 years. That's where I left Tuesday when I left Finland. That's our headquarters in Helsinki in Finland, which is where I've been working for 21 years now, so quite a while. Our uh, closest office to where we are right now would be this building here in Kuala Lumpur, which is F-Secure Malaysia, uh, our regional headquarters, which also hosts our local research lab here in Malaysia, where we do local analysis and, and response for customers around the world. Overall, we have offices in 22 countries. And the way F-Secure does business is we work with the operators, which means we are mostly behind the scenes. We are mostly providing security to millions of users who have never heard of F-Secure. Because we work with their operators and they typically don't see us at all. And that's the way we like it. But it also gives us a very good window to the world of attacks because we see such a massive amount of traffic through more than 250 operators around the world. And that gives us a, an insight on who's behind the attacks, what are the techniques they use in the attacks, what are the motives of the attackers. So the rough split I use on the attackers is a split in three. Split in three based on why these different parties are doing the attacks. Number one, criminals. And this is by far the biggest group, by far the most active group. The vast majority of attacks we analyze are being done by criminals. And it's actually interesting to think about this because this isn't, um, it, it always wasn't like this. PC viruses were found in 1986, so 26 years ago. For the first 15 years, all the malware was being written by hobbyists and teenagers for fun. They had no real motive at all. They were just doing it because they could or because of the challenge or because they thought it was fun. Criminals have been in the picture only for 10 years, even less than that. The very first money-making PC malware was found in 2003, so nine years ago. Originally, all of this was being monetized by using malware to infect Windows computers to build botnets to send spam. So it was the uh, coming together of malware writers and spammers that was the initial money-making mechanism. But since then, the scenario has changed completely. Hobbyists have practically disappeared. We don't see malware attackers who have no motive. Look, basically, everybody has a motive now. Some random hobbyist might still exist, but it really isn't even on the map. And in addition of money-making attackers, we have two other groups. We have hacktivists who are actually fairly close to hobbyists, but they do have a motive. They want to achieve something with their attacks. Typically, they want to protest. They have a political motive, or they want to send a message. This includes movements like Anonymous and Antisec and Lulzsec and other similarities. And then the third group are different kinds of attacks launched by governments. And there's a wide range of stuff here coming from uh, intelligence agencies using attacks for espionage purposes to law enforcement using backdoors and trojans against their own citizens while they are doing investigations, all the way to attacks like Stuxnet, Flame, Gauss, and Dugu, which are cyber attacks. One day, we might see cyber war. And I want to emphasize this. We haven't seen cyber war. Why? Because we haven't seen a war. I mean, wars are something that's fought between nations. What's happening between the United States and Israel and Iran right now, whatever it is, it isn't a war. I don't remember anybody declaring a war between these countries. It's clearly cyber attacks. Sure. But we really shouldn't be using the word cyber war when we don't have one, because one day we will have one, and then we need the word for that. We are just causing unnecessary inflation 
for the word, where it doesn't really achieve that level of attacks yet. Because during our lifetime, even if we wish we wouldn't, we most likely will see conflicts, crises, and wars between technically advanced nations. And then when you have that, you will have army of country A attacking the computer systems of army of country B. And if that isn't cyber war, then I don't know what is. But we haven't seen that. There are other groups in addition of these main three. Um, for example, earlier this year, I spent quite a while investigating whether we should be worried about cyber terrorism. And when I, when I say cyber terrorism, I don't mean hacking or anonymous or anything like that. I mean real, real world terror groups using computers to benefit their operations. So Al Qaeda, uh, other uh, Islam extremist groups or white supremacist groups or uh, other terror groups. And throughout my research, well, it was easy to see that these groups, they all use computers, they all use the net, they communicate, they use their own encryption system. Al-Qaeda has their own encryption uh, program they use to encrypt email connectivity. Um, they use the internet to spread their message, they use it for propaganda, and they use it for recruitment. But that's not really cyber terrorism. Real cyber terrorism would be to actually do attacks or at least assist attacks with some sort of cyber capability or cyber element. And that we really haven't seen. I did find individuals, especially in the Islamist extremist groups, who were clearly hackers and, and were using tools like Metasploit and Backtrack and were trying to teach others. But they were so few and far between that it really isn't a problem yet. Then again, it's only likely to get worse. But the basic split is this, criminals, hacktivists, governments. And criminals is the easiest group to understand because they do whatever they do to make money. And money is a very easy motive. I mean, we all go to jobs, we all go to work to make money. So if somebody can become rich by writing malware, well, somebody will do it. So let's take a look at some examples and cases of exactly how this works. How do the criminals get their hands on cash? So this is Matthias Skorjank from Slovenia, pictured at the courthouse in, uh, in Slovenia. Well, he went, went into court half a year ago for the Mariposa botnet. This here um, is Mihai Giata, pictured as he's exiting his Porsche in Bucharest in Romania. He's related to this guy, another Romanian guy who's been tracking for quite a while. And this guy here is Vladimir Chachin from the city of Tarto in Estonia. Now all these examples are Eastern Europeans and these same countries keep coming up over and over again. Lots of organized criminal activity from Russia, from Ukraine, from Belarus, from Kazakhstan, from Romania, from Moldova. Then we have other groups of attackers, the Chinese, which are clearly very active as well. Lots of commercial, criminal, organized activity from there as well. Lots of Brazilians, especially targeting local Brazilian banks, which, is, which are probably being targeted more than any other bank anywhere in the world. So what's common to all these areas? Well, in one way or another, they're all developing areas. I mean, there's, there are areas where there's lots of people with skills, but it might be hard to find a well-paying job with your computer programming or networking skills. In fact, it might be easiest to become rich to go into life of crime because once you go to the life of online crime, the whole world is at your disposal. These guys don't really care who their victims are. They don't really care where in the world the victims are. As long as they make money, that's what counts. So how much money are these guys making? Vladimir was running the operation which we know as DNS Changer and uh, DNS Changer made the headlines earlier this year. It actually made the headlines when the network was finally shut down, a network which was uh, fairly large at its time. But I think the best way to illustrate how successful Vladimir has been as a computer crime businessman is to take a look at what he owns. So I'm from Finland. Estonia is right across the border, across the Baltic Sea. 
Um, and if you go to Estonia, which isn't a very large country, and you take a look at public records of properties that Vladimir Chachin owns legally in Estonia, it's quite remarkable. So properties, so houses, basically. This guy owns 155 separate properties in Estonia. He's been investing his money into real estate, which is probably a good move. Like if you make a lot of money in cybercrime or computer crime, you want to invest it somewhere safe or somewhere where you can actually make, make more money out of it. 155 real estate properties owned by Vladimir Chachin. I think that's remarkable. This guy was running the Carburb operation uh, from Moscow. We actually have a video clip. Let, let me play you a minute of this clip from Russian television. Do we have the audio on? Полицейских сотрудники столичного отдела К задержали компьютерщиков, которых подозревают в создании и распространении через сеть интернет опасного вируса. Хитрая программа позволила хакерам заработать 60 миллионов рублей. Репортаж Михаила Чебаненко. Обычный путь через дверь в квартиру на восьмом этаже полицейские отмели сразу. Так можно было сорвать спецоперацию. Подозреваемый мог выбросить улики в окно. Теперь это исключено. Когда в комнате появились люди в масках, хозяин спал. За этим мужчиной сотрудники управления К, они занимаются раскрытием преступлений в сфере компьютерных технологий, следили несколько месяцев. Подозреваемый вместе с сообщником... You gotta like it how the uh, Russian law enforcement takes no shit when they want to raid a, uh, a cyber criminal. They send a SWAT team to rappel in from the roof, which is nice. I have a feeling it was more of like a TV opportunity that, you know, they just happened to have the TV crew there shooting when they were going in and all that. But, uh, another ex example on just how bold some of these guys are and how, how openly they operate, because they, they really feel that you know, getting caught like that guy just did in Moscow are really the exceptions. For most of these guys, they know they will never be caught. They know that they will, they will uh, have no chance of somebody finding them, and even if they do, they will, won't get arrested. Even if they get arrested, they won't get sentenced. So some of these operate really openly. This is from YouTube. This is a guy called Kuapo, and he's running a service called ddosservice.org, which is a website where you can order distributed denial of service attacks. And they are so open about it, they actually post ads of their services. So you're here for one reason. And that reason is, is because you need your business competitors, rivals, haters, or whatever the reason is, or who, they are to go down. Well, you, my friend, you've came to the right place. If you want your business competitors to go down, well, they can. If you want your rivals to go offline, well, they will. Not only that, we are providing a short-term to long-term DDoS service or scheduled attack starting $5 per hour for small personal websites to $10 to $50 per hour for huge DDoS protected websites. Prices may depend on how huge the website is or how protected it is. With four years of DDoS and experience and several years of studying on DDoS protection, you cannot go wrong! So if anybody's interested in the service, the URL was um, down here, ddosservice.org. Many of these criminal attacks, or practically all of them today, are being distributed through the web. This is the problem. The web is the problem. People get infected because they choose to browse the web. So where do you get infected? Well, you get infected by visiting a site you know and trust, a site you've been going every day for years and years, let's say some news site or some magazine, because it got hacked and now it had an exploit. Or you get infected by using Google. You go to Google, you Google for something, and then you click on results. One of the results goes to a web website which has no useful content at all. It just has a lot of keywords, but it also has an exploit. And this site was set up from the very beginning just to own people. Now, it wasn't always like this. We, we've had other vectors, major vectors. For example, email and email attachments used to be the number one way of getting infected. It isn't anymore. It hasn't been for five years. It's the web. We have some other routes, like USB sticks, which are a real problem, but they're nowhere near the amount of infections that are being caused by web surfing. And almost all of these infections through these websites are being caused by exploit kits. And the king of the hills of different exploit kits 
is black hole. Black hole has lots of competition. Most of these, again, made in Russia or in Ukraine and sold on underground sites. Black hole, black hole has been around for a couple of years. It's developed by a guy called Paunch, who we believe is now changing his nickname to Kidnap. And he's selling this typical price, with, depending on the options, somewhere between 1,000 to 2,000 US dollars for the kit. But it's a very professional kit. Once you buy it, um, it's sort of a turnkey solution. You can even lease uh, web, uh, black hole licenses. So you don't even have to buy, you can rent an exploit kit. And the exploit kit is completely invisible for the victim. The victim goes to a website and the website looks just like it used to. Five years ago, 10 years ago, if somebody would hack a website, somebody would gain access to a large profile site, they would just delete the site and put some stupid defacement messages there and send greetings to their friends. Everybody would immediately see the site is hacked. Today, when the same thing happens, they don't change the site at all. They include one line of JavaScript to every single page on the site, and that JavaScript la launches black hole. And black hole goes through the infected machine, or the machine to be infected, trying to find something that can be exploited. And this is very extensive. It goes through your operating system, your browser, your browser plugins and extensions, trying to find anything that could be exploited. And it typically isn't the operating system that has vulnerabilities because most of these are Windows boxes. Most of them are updated automatically through Windows updates or Microsoft updates. It even typically isn't the browser because Firefox, Chrome, IE, they update automatically. It's typically the plugins. And this here, this is the administrator front end for black hole. So this is what the attacker sees. The victim never sees it. It's what the attacker sees. He gets real-time statistics on how many victims have visited the websites where he's running Black Hole right now. Real-time statistics and analytics on where they are coming, which country, which operating system, which browser, and how many of them were infected. And this system is very powerful. If you, for example, look at typical statistics showing that on this particular system, um, people, uh, 16,144 visitors have become exploited because they had an outdated version of Java. Then maybe 2,000 more got pwned because they had an outdated version of the Adobe PDF Reader plugin. Some got owned because they had an outdated version of Flash and so on. But this figure keeps on repeating. Over and over again, it's Java that's the problem. Let me be particular about this. It's not Java itself. It's the Java plugin in the browser, which is the problem. There's nothing wrong with Java, or Java as a language, or Java apps. It's the Java applets for which you need the plugin in your browser. I dropped Java from all of my production systems two years ago. I haven't needed it for anything. I recommend this to anybody of you. Some of you can't do it because you have some intranet system or maybe some online bank or something which requires Java. Then you might want to have a separate browser for that service only. And in your daily browser, you drop the plugin you immediately redact your risk of getting had by something like black hole in, in, immensely. But there's something else I wanted, wanted to show about black hole. Um, if you look closer at the, the administrator front end, to get an idea of how popular black hole is and just how many attackers have bought and are using black hole, the best way to get an understanding of that is to pay attention at what's at the top of the screen. Because they have banner ads at top of the screens. So these are ads shown at the admin interface, which are only seen by the criminals. So there's enough criminals who bought and are using Black Hole that it's worth their while to actually run an ad network for criminal ads to the administrators of Black Hole administrator panels. And the typical ads, like here, they are selling hosting, bulletproof hosting in, in Syria, of all places, or mass domain registration service, which you can pay with uh, Liberty Re Reserve, uh, web money, and Paymer, all anonymous money moving mechanisms. For malware, for traffic, and the other things. So if you need lots of domains, these guys are willing to sell them to you. Can you just believe that? These guys run their own ad networks just for criminals, banner ads for criminals. That's the way it works. And in Black Hole 2, which was released a month ago, um, they, Paunch has now added new features. For example, it now separately detects mobile users. So if you browse to a website which has the exploit kit running with, a, with an iPhone, with an Android phone, with a Nokia device, 
um, you get put to a separate group. They don't launch exploits against mobile devices yet. But you could, for example, show you know, rogue ads or something else to mobile users. And they also added support for Windows 8. And I especially like how they even added the right icon for Windows 8. Now that's Windows 8 users who have now visited Black Hole Exploit Kit. Then we have the ransom Trojans. So these are Trojans which will take over the computer and demand a payment to continue to use the computer. And many of these, the most popular of these right now, claim to be from the police. So your computer gets locked down with a message explaining that this is the police. We've seen that your computer has been used to store illegal MP3 songs and torrented movies. And you also seem to have child porn on your hard drive. And there's some terrorist motives found from your emails. And now the police has locked your system and you will have to pay a fine. The fine is typically 100 euros or 200 dollars. And this message keeps changing on where in the world you are. Right now, this toolkit supports 15 different countries. United States, Canada, and 13 European countries with local branding, with the name of the local police, translated to the local language. It's fairly well done. And the amount of money these guys are making, once again, it's significant. We know because we worked with PaySafeCard, which is the payment mechanism. These guys are actually moving money to their services. And I especially like a, a counter um, measure that PaySafeCard is now using to cut down the, with the amount of money being sent to these criminals. Because right now, if you go in many of the European countries, when you go and buy, go, go to a uh, kiosk and, and buy a PaySafeCard to send the ransom to these guys, the PaySafeCard receipt will automatically print a text which says that if you bought this card to pay for a fine for something that was shown to you on your computer, don't. It's fake. And that's very effective because that's the only way these guys actually get the money. And the victims will see the warning when they go and buy the card to pay the ransom. And of course, people have no idea that it's, it's, it's a Trojan. They think it's really the police. And it isn't the police. The problem is sizable. Honeynet guys released a very nice visualization called map.honeynet.org just last week. Uh, it's in the alpha version right now, but I suggest you to take a look. I would actually show it to you live, but either the network here doesn't support it for some reason, or it's down right now. But it has a very nice live view of uh, computers which are, or botnets all over the world. Um, this was released two days ago by the researchers of University of California, San Diego. Um, this is visualization on how the Sality botnet scanned through the internet um, around 10 months ago. They took four days and they scanned through the whole IPv4 address space. You can actually see the addresses here in the top corner. So they are going through uh, every single IP address in the world. And you can see where the scanning uh, is taking place. It's taking place all over the world. They were actually scanning for um, SIP systems, so voice over IP systems for, to be used for some exploit or some vulnerability which has been found from those systems. But it's quite remarkable. You can actually see the activity is very active right now. You can see here that they stop for three days. So watch how the activity dies out right about now. And it just goes away. There's just some slight backscatter for a while. And then three days later, it jumps back up all, all together. Another uh, um, visualization we recently did in our labs, I really like this. We, this is real-time data. We actually use our real-time interface to see where in the world we are stopping malware. But one of the guys who was building the visualization part for this just thought it would be look much nicer with this retro feel. So this is 2012. This is real-time data. These are real infections in the world. It just doesn't look like it. And then last week, we released a KML file of uh, the uh, key nodes of the zero access botnet. Let me actually see if my uh, Google Earth is operational. It is operational, but let's see if I can actually move around at all. All right, let's try zooming in. There we go. So the red dots are not 
computers infected by zero access. The red nodes are the key nodes. Well, they're infected machines as well, but you can think of them as super nodes. So they control the peer-to-peer -peer network for the whole, whole botnet. And this is a large botnet. It is sizable for, by, by any measure. Um, let's actually go try to zoom out a little bit more. When you have more than 100,000 dots or uh, key points in Google Earth, it starts to slow down. Even this four core laptop is, is barely able to keep up. But let's see if we can actually see what's happening here in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, well, I think we, it's just too slow, too slow. Well, you can find the KML file from our uh, blog from uh, fsecure.com slash weblog, and you can look around it yourself. But there's plenty of stuff happening right here as well. And zero access is actually a good example on just how big these things can become. If we think historically, what, what, what's, what's the biggest case we've seen? One of the biggest cases, maybe the biggest case in history, might have been Love Letter or I Love You in year 2000, which was a massive uh, email worm. And it was so successful because at the time, people didn't really, really know what was happening. They didn't really understand, and nobody was really running good protection. Um, the estimates range, but it definitely infected tens of millions, maybe even 50 million computers around the world, which is sizable. Um, Configur from four years ago infected more than 10 million computers, maybe 15 million computers. Um, flashback, which was the massive Mac OS X outbreak earlier this year, infected around half a million computers, which doesn't sound as large, but of course there's much less Macs. So percentage-wise, it was huge. Um, Stormworm infected somewhere in the range of five million computers, maybe. Zero access is probably nine million, and it's active right now. So it's configure level, almost to the level of configure in the amount of infections. So what's zero access? Well, zero access <clears throat> is once again commercial kit. It's a uh, um, Rootkit bundle being developed by and sold by a guy called Ring Zero or Ringo. And um, here's his for sale ad from a Russian forum where he's listing different features, providing 24 hours to port, um, very low level, will infect the MBR of the computer. So when you boot up an infected Windows system, the very first thing that's executed on the computer is the malware. And the malware then boots up Windows and it stays alive through Windows booting up, even 64-bit Windows 7 booting up. Um, they're now adding support for 64-bit Windows 8. Um, they guarantee undetectability, which we, of course, try to counteract, but they keep updating it. Um, they definitely are able to bypass most rootkit detectors. Um, and it comes with a user-friendly admin panel, so that's a nice feature as well. So these things are really becoming professional. But even more interesting is what's happening in Brazil right now, because these things will need to infect your Windows computer to be able to work. They come through the web, but they will need to be, have some code, some binary code running on your Windows PC. With zero access, it actually has to be able to write to your boot sector, so very low-level stuff. What was happening in Brazil earlier this year is quite remarkable, because they had a very large-scale infection, around four, maybe five million infections, which were not infected Windows computers. Four to five million devices got infected. They were DSL boxes. And this is, uh, in many ways, a remarkable case because people got infected through the web. They got infected through a cross-site uh, request forgery. You go to an infected website or hacked website, it runs a couple of lines of HTML, which will affect the settings of your DSL router. All DSL, well, almost all DSL routers, regardless of the manufacturer, run in the 192.168 space, most of them in 192.168.1.1. And these Brazilian ISPs were using the same passwords on every single box. So by using cross-site request forgery, you could actually go from a website to the settings of the DSL box, and you could change the settings. Some of the Brazilian ISPs reported that 50% of their customers had, were affected by this. The request forgery was 
actually very simple, nothing special needed. They would change the password uh, of the DSL and they would change the DNS settings of the DSL box. They would change the primary DNS server to a criminal DNS server, which they were controlling themselves, and the secondary DNS server to 8888, which is the Google DNS server. So if their own DNS server was down or overwhelmed, they would ba uh, fall back to the regular DNS server, which would give normal access. And their own DNS server was serving all the sites with the right IPs except google.com, google.com.br, Brazilian Google, MSN, live.com, uh, facebook.com, and a couple others. And they would change those sites. When you would go to Google, Google would prompt you that you have to install Google Defense, this new Google security system. And this would be coming from the real Google site, except it isn't the real Google site because it's being redirected to a different IP, but it looks like Google. And now it will prompt you to download Google Defense.exe, or if you're in Facebook, or in uh, MSN, something else. And they could have used this to do lots of bad stuff. This is what they were doing. Uh, these were basically banking trojans targeting Brazilian banks. But it's quite a remarkable attack. And what's interesting here is that once your DSL box in your house gets infected, now all the DNS traffic is forged, not just for the Windows computer. You use the same DSL box with your iPad. It gets the same results. You use it with your phones. They get the wrong results as well. Obviously, they won't be able to run this EXE, but they could have launched completely di different attacks, or let's say phishing scams, which would have worked on all of these devices. So this attack wasn't really Windows-specific, or it could have been much more wide-ranging. And this here is from the manual of um, Zeus. Let's see if I actually have the manual right here. So when you buy Zeus, the banking trojan, it comes with a manual which details on how to use the banking trojan, how to target different banks, how to run the control panel, the syntax of the uh, configuration file, the macros, um, what kind of hardware requirements they have, how to install it and maintain it, how to remotely manage it. I think this criminal banking trojan is better documented than most undevoured products out there. And these guys, have been very successful in targeting banks. Zeus went open source, or the source was leaked last year, after which we've seen tons of different versions, like modified versions, like Citadel and IceX and others. And then there's the competition, um, the SpyEye toolkit, which, is, which uses a compatible configuration file. Uh, so it's, it's a very, very tight competition between different banking trojans. And the prices of banking trojans also range somewhere in the $1,000 to $2,000 range when you buy these. The way they make money is that when people go from infected Windows computers to do online banking, the, the Trojan on their computer will insert extra transactions or change the money amounts or and account numbers when you pay bills. So what I do when I go and visit customers, when I go to companies, what I like to do is that I... I ask to them to show me around. Let's have a walk around in your office. And they show me around. And here's, here's manufacturing, and here's uh, our researchers, and here's the design department, and so on. Then I ask them, OK, uh, could you show me who pays the company's bills? Could you show me the person who's in charge of paying the bills of this company? And they take me to a corner. It's always a corner room, typically on a high floor. And there's always this uh, middle-aged woman there. And she's the one paying the bills. If it's a small or medium company, it's one woman. If it's an enterprise, it's a room full of middle-aged women. But they are the ones paying the bills. And if it's a large company, the amount of money they move every single day can be tens of thousands of dollars, even hundreds of thousands of dollars. For enterprises, they move millions every month. And the way companies do online banking is not that different from the way you do online banking. They sit with a web browser. They are logged into an online bank. They type in money, figures, and accounts. They might have some extra features, like many banks, for corporate banking, they have an extra card reader or something like that. But it's not like these wouldn't be bypassable by banking trojans. They're completely bypassable. So I talk with the lady. They're always very nice. Then I, I ask him two questions. I ask her two questions. Question number one, could you show me the computer that you use to move money around? And she's a bit confused, and then she points at the computer on the desk. Well, right here. 
And then I ask, like, roughly how much money you move, and like, it could be $100,000 a month, or it could be $2 million a month, lots of money. And then I ask the last question, could you now show me the computer that you use to go to Facebook and go to YouTube and to surf the web and to read your email? Could you now show that computer? And now she's even more confused, and she points at the same computer, and they almost immediately get my point. They're like, hmm, that's actually a stupid idea. Like, I'm using this computer to move millions every month. Computers cost like 200 euros or 300 dollars. Like, maybe it would be a good idea to have a separate computer just for paying the bills. And then another computer for doing everything else. But this never crosses their mind unless, you know, you, know, you really point it out to them. And I originally pointed this out years ago in a completely different scenario because we were investigating a break-in where a professional poker player, a guy who plays poker for a living around the world, in the real world and on online casinos, he was hit by a Trojan and he lost hundreds of thousands of euros because somebody had installed a Trojan on his computer which gave them a screenshot feature. They could just take a screenshot of his screen and see his cards. And if, if you're playing poker and I know your cards, I'm going to win, right? So this guy lost hundreds of thousands of euros because of this. And the advice I gave to him was exactly the same. Like, come on, you are a professional. This laptop is your professional tool. Like, when you don't use it to play poker, you close it down and you put it into a safe. And then you have a separate computer for doing everything else. And if he was a millionaire. He could easily you know, afford to buy two or three or five computers. Yet he was using this one computer to surf the web and look at videos and play poker with millions. So in many cases, it really isn't more complicated than that. And we aren't getting even this right. So what about then these guys who are not doing their attacks to make money? Well, movements like Anonymous it's much harder for people on the street to understand these guys because they aren't trying to make money. Money is an easy motive to understand. These guys take big risks. They risk getting jailed or, or getting taken down. Yet there's no immediate reward for themselves because they typically hide for a higher cause or a higher cause that they see themselves. They have a protest motive or a political motive. Some of these guys get caught. Um, the biggest catch so far has been Sabu, or Anonymous Sabu, who was arrested by US officials and turned into a snitch, or turned into a, uh, an informant for the US government. He was very active in the Anonymous Underground for several months while he was working for the FBI. But let me just give you an example on how companies make themselves a target. I have here two guys. Some of you might know these guys. This is George Hotz, known also as GeoHot. Geo and uh, this is uh, Nicolas Allegro, known also as Comex. They're both programmers. They both had the same problem. They both wanted to run their own programs on their own devices. GeoHot wanted to run his own program on his own Sony PlayStation 3. But you can't do that because you can only run the programs you buy from the shop, which have been approved by Sony. So he broke the security system of his PlayStation 3 by rooting it. And now anybody could run any programs they wanted on their PlayStations. And Sony didn't like this. So what did Sony do? Sony sued him. This created a massive protest campaign, and Sony became a target. Since then, Sony has been hacked more than 30 times, including the Sony PlayStation Network breach, which is one of the largest data breaches in history. So what about Nicolas? Well, he wanted to run his own programs as well. He wanted to run his programs on his phone, iPhone. So he created Jailbreak Me. Apple saw that. Apple didn't like it. What did Apple do? They did not sue Nicolas. They hired him. He's now working at Apple. Good move, right? Because nobody got angry at Apple. He's probably in a great position within Apple to 
no, improve the overall security of the system with his skills. And Apple has never been targeted by attacks like Sony has been targeted with. And don't get me wrong, I'm not really trying to defend these guys in any way. Because obviously what they're doing is, is criminal. What I'm just saying is that organizations which become targets of, at of attacks like these, in many ways they, they made themselves a target or they could have known beforehand that what we're doing right now will make us a target. And many companies can minimize this level of risk by just thinking it through before taking actions. So what about governmental attacks then? Attacks which are not coming from criminals, which are not coming from hacktivists, but governments themselves. Attacks like what the German government has been doing against their own people, against their own citizens, where they hire Trojan authors and backdoor creators to work for the government to write Trojans, which they then use to infect their own citizens during criminal investigations. Now, I don't see any problem with this, as long as the suspect turns out to be guilty. But if the suspect turns out to be innocent, this is a horrible breach of security and confidentiality. And I'm not really sure if we really want our governments doing this to us. And this also brings us to the next question, which is, what should antivirus companies do by attacks like this? Like when, when, when it's government, when it's the police using the Trojans, should antivirus companies look away and allow them those Trojans to run so the police can use it? Because if antiviruses detect them, the police can't use them. Hell no. We shouldn't. We should try to detect them. And that's what we do. We've never been approached by never law enforcement agency asking not to detect their Trojans. But if they do, we won't comply. We will detect their Trojans because we believe this is what our customers want. When our customers come to us, and we would give them the option. Here's an antivirus which detects everything we know. And here's an antivirus which detects everything we know except the police Trojans. Which one would you like to buy? Then we have the attacks like APTs, which are typically used for espionage purposes, in most cases by governments targeting other governments or targeting private sector in other countries, targeting defense contractors. And they are almost always launched with booby-trapped emails in spoofed email messages, which look like real messages and contain realistic looking document files like these. These are all examples of booby trap files, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and PDF files. And when you open these files, you get owned. They look real, they act real, but they contain an exploit which drops a backdoor. And by the time you have this on your screen, you have already a backdoor on your system, a backdoor connecting back to the attackers, and they gain access to whatever you have on your computer and in your local area network. And then we have the real military action. Again, no cyber war here, not yet. But it's quite clear that what Stuxnet started in 2009 is an arms race. And all the other governments which have any capability are now busy building their own capability to build cyber offensive attacks. Not defensive, offensive attacks. So the atom energy um, scientists or nuclear scientists, well, it's pretty clear that they lost their innocence in 1945 when we started using nuclear weapons. Exactly in the same way, computer scientists lost their innocence in 2009 when we started using Stuxnet. I think that's how big a change this will be seen in history books later on. So back to Iran, back to ACDC and Thunderstruck. The Atom Energy Organization of Iran, it's actually interesting when you go to Google Maps and you, for example, look at the Bushware nuclear power plant. Google Maps labels like here's the ventilation chimney, 
Here's the solid waste building, electrical building, turbine building, emergency feed water building. Like, what the hell? How can Google Maps have this information? But they do. You, I, I took the screenshot yesterday. Um, looking at some of the research material Atom Energy Organization of Iran is putting out, they actually have pretty extensive nuclear research capability. And I was actually interested to find from the website of the Atom Energy Organization of Iran, they have actually a statement, official statement, which says, um, somewhere around here, it says Mikko Hyppönen and F-Secure. And they say that these claims given by Mikko Hyppönen about Thunderstruck playing in their computers is patently false. This hasn't happened. They deny any, any acknowledgement of anything like this ever happening. But like I said, we don't know. But it is interesting that when we look at the latest malware which has been used by the United States and Israel against Iran and some other Middle Eastern countries, because we have Stuxnet, Flame, Duku, and Gauss. Gauss was found three months ago. Gauss doesn't try to explode centrifuges or anything like that. It's just an information gathering tool. And it encrypts the network traffic when it's sending it out from the computer. And the encryption isn't very strong. It's actually a... Uh, 16-bit XOR, and the value it uses for the encryption is ACDC. Now, that could be a coincidence, right? But if you take the code and look at it, that's what it is. So, We have a hard time detecting malware like Flame. Flame, which spoofed the Windows updates mechanism, which um, created a um, MD5 hash collision so that the binary it's sending through the spoofed Windows update mechanism would be accepted by other computers in the same local area network. And spoofing MD5s, it's doable, but it, it isn't that easy. And the way they spoofed it, the way they forged the hash collision was completely new, completely novel. If you look at, read the cryptographers' mailing lists, they're all really excited about this new discovery, that somebody came up with this completely new and novel way of forging MD5 hash collisions. And, and this is world-class research, and somebody would have used a supercomputer to do this. And it's sort of obvious that there really aren't very many places on this planet which have supercomputers and world-class crypto researchers. And it must have been weird inside Microsoft when they realized that this has happened. When they realized that somebody has broken the security of their most important network, Microsoft Updates, which is used and relied upon by 900 million paying Microsoft customers, they all get their updates from there. They all trust that these updates are secure. So somebody had broken that security and somebody had misused their certificate. So they had, had actually had to revoke one of the Microsoft root certificates. And when they realized that this was actually done against them by their own government, well, that must have been weird. Now, we missed flame. We missed Stuxnet, we missed Gauss, we missed Duku. We missed all of them for a year or two. And not just we, but the whole antivirus industry. The antivirus industry often gets a bad rap around other security industries. Many people think that we are somehow, you know, it's not that hard to build an antivirus. How hard could it be to stop these viruses? Come on. Well, let me tell you, it's hard. Many of the best minds in all of security industry that I know work in antivirus. This is one of the toughest challenges we have. It really isn't easy. And yet we keep failing. I was in a customer meeting in Austria in July, right after I wrote a column for the Wired magazine about how we failed to block flame. And I knew that our customers would be asking me tough questions about that. So I explained to them why we missed flame. And I explained it by showing two photos. The first photo is this. He's a street robber, most likely somewhere in South America. 
stops cars on the road with a gun, steals the wallet of the passengers, earns his living like that. He doesn't care who the target is as long as he gets the wallets. And the cyber equivalent of him is Zeus and Spy Eye and Zero Access, credit card keyloggers, banking Trojans, ransom Trojans, money making attacks. If somebody wants to steal your credit card number with a keylogger, he doesn't care if you're from Malaysia or if you're from Singapore or if you're from Australia. It doesn't matter as long as he gets the credit card. So he targets everybody and anybody. And we can handle this problem. This is what we can handle. Flame and Stuxnet are not like this. Flame and Stuxnet are not, not like this guy. Flame and Stuxnet are like this guy. James Bond, with the unlimited budget, unlimited budget, no budget, with the greatest technology, greatest and latest technology in the world, with unlimited resources. And if James Bond wants to kill you, James Bond will kill you, right? It doesn't matter if you run and hide, he will find you. It doesn't matter if you have a helmet and a bulletproof vest, he will kill you anyway. So trying to defend against a governmental level attacker is just like trying to defend against James Bond. It's very hard. And I'm not saying we've given up, because we haven't. I'm saying it's very hard. It's very easy to fail. But the good news is that James Bond doesn't want to kill you, right? He wants to kill the ones who have done something to deserve it. Flame and Stuxnet don't want to infect you. That's the good part of the story. And with that, thank you very much.